So one of the story that I have coming up now is really nothing in relationship to my career as a law enforcement officer, but in 1971, uh, I attended the University of New Mexico and I had a Naval Scholarship, NROTC, which is Naval Reserve Officer Training Corps. And you'd study PNS, which is Principal in Naval Sciences, and in, the <coughs> in conjunction with your regular uh, university curriculum. And on the, in the summer of 1972, uh, we went on what was known as a PAC NAR mid cruise, which is where they place you onto a uh, naval ship. I was on the USS Fox, which is a guided missile frigate, DLG 33, and you spend the entire summer at sea. And the job there was to learn all the combat systems, operation of uh, principles of naval warfare, anti submarine uh, warfare. You learn ship systems, you learn propulsion, you learned all about. Um, the, uh, we had guided missiles, we had uh, five inch guns, three inch guns. So you learn about the entire operation of a naval ship. And as a midshipman, you are lower than whale, you know what? I mean, you are the lowest. And I think there were only three of us that were midshipmen one from Naval Academy and another friend of mine, Jake Sparks, who went to school with me at UNM. <clears throat> anyway, so we're out at sea for over a month. And as a midshipman, uh, because you are lower than whale, you know what? Uh, you're working about 20 hours a day, seven days a week, four hours off, and they put you in every, you know, down in the engine room, boiler rooms. You're working in, uh, you're working in uh, the Tactical Operations Command Center. Um, you know, you're working on uh, ASW, learning about sonar, learning about uh, navigation, uh, all about the propulsion systems and so forth. So it's kind of fascinating if you've never been on a naval uh, warship. Uh, it's pretty interesting, especially as a young kid. Well, we're coming into Pearl Harbor, and one of the things they do is midshipmen are very famous for doing stupid things because you're a kid. So <clears throat> I was down in the engine room, which is about, about 6,000 degrees, and it's about 200% humidity, soaking wet and covered in, in oil and everything else, reading thousands of gauges, and you, have a, you walk around with a checklist and everything else. Chief walks in, and uh, midshipman reach, yeah, and I run up, yes, yeah, yeah, sir, sir, midshipman reach reporting. And he said, uh, here's a, t gives me a uh, three by five index card, and it said, put any information you have in Honolulu of anybody you know, relatives or whatever. So I put down an, an address and a name, and I hand it back to him. And, uh, you know, the officers kind of, uh, you know, enlisted guys hate you, the officers hate you. Basically, everybody hates you as a midshipman, and you just get used to it. And they really screw with you. They ask you for relative bearing grease. They ask you for you know, to secure some water line. Uh, they'll say there's a GU-11 off to the you know the port side of the ship, and that's basically a seagull. They call it GU-11, so you're in there with binos looking for the GU-11, and officers and enlisted people are watching you for about half an hour trying to figure out what the hell a GU-11 is. It's some kind of Russian aircraft or something. Anyway, I handed off the card. <coughs> about an hour later. Chief comes running down, reads, report to the captain's office immediately. So I go running up the, you know, up the ladders and everything else, and bam, you pound. Back then as a midshipman, you, know, you pound on the door as hard as you can. Midshipman, reads, reporting, sir. And he goes, you know, enter. So I enter. I go in the wardroom. Every officer's in there. And back then, they're all smoking. They have coffee. They have this green table. All the stewards are uh, by the side. And it's about 6,000 degrees cooler than it was down in the engine room. I am covered in oil, soaking sweat and everything else. And the captain looks at me and says, sit down, Reeds. I sit down at the end of the table. And all these officers, every officer on the ship's there. <clears throat> he pulls up this card and he goes, got a question for you. Yes, sir. Yes, Captain. He goes, the name you have here, that you have on this card and the address, see in the armed forces? Yes, sir. Huh. Is he in the Navy? Yes, sir. Is he Commander-in-Chief of the Pacific Fleet? I went, yes, sir. And this is your uncle, Uncle Chick? Is as you refer to him, I understand? Yes, sir. He goes, good. You'll be having dinner with us tonight in the wardroom. So I went, oh, my God. So you can imagine, obviously, word spread that the, that's a four-star admiral. Uh, <clears throat> and he was one of the, uh, Uncle Chick Clary, you look him up, the bridge which uh, 
it goes in Pearl Harbor, which <clears throat> goes toward the USS Arizona from land, uh, is named after him. And really nice guy. I always, I always loved him. And really great guy. Uh, very humble. Um, I read a book where one of the Navy SEALs came across him in the 70s. I was really impressed with how he treated the SEALs back then. Uh, he was also one of the most decorated uh, World War II uh, naval submarine commanders. And you can look up his autobiography on it, but really neat guy. Anyway, so this is about two days out from going into Pearl. Well, we get into Pearl Harbor, and as we pull up, lo and behold, his car comes up, you know, and everybody's on the side. Uh, you know, some of the people have their families there. But up comes the fleet admiral. You got an American flag on one, you got the four stars on the other, and the limbo with the Navy driver pulls up, and out gets my mother, uh, Barbara Scott Reitz, and uh, Aunt Jean, Jean Clary. Uh, in the photo that accompanying this uh, article is a, a girl that I went to school with at UNM, Coco Summers. So they pull up, they come up the gangplank, we go on the fantail of the ship, they take a picture, it goes out in the Navy Times and everything else. And I tried to downplay the whole thing. I never wanted anybody to know that I had any kind of relatives. They knew, you know, I didn't want them to know my father was a Navy captain. My mother had worked for Department of the Navy. Uh, that's where she met my father on the steps of the Naval Building in Washington, D.C. My, one of my uncles, well, or I'm sorry, one of my cousins was a, uh, an admiral. The other one was a commander, lieutenant commander, I believe. Uh, so, and my grandfather was a Naval uh, captain in submarines, Leon V. Scott. So I came from this long tradition of Navy and you were expected to go in to the Navy, you were expected to serve the military and everything else, but because I had lived on Navy bases my entire life, I, uh, and had been around the military my entire life, I didn't know anybody outside really the military, even when we didn't live on base. The people we associated with were all Naval officers, uh, the kids of Naval officers and so forth. So. I kind of became a hippie for a while, left ROTC after two years, kind of declined to go in, and ultimately, fortuitously for me, I ended up going on or gaining entrance into the Los Angeles Police Department, and uh, it turned out to be a very rewarding career. Uh, but the interesting thing about that entire caper was after that, we transferred to the USS Reeves, which I believe was a, a DLG, also a guided missile frigate 24. And of course, everything that was found out about me and my relationship to Sink Pack Fleet, which is Commander in Chief Pacific Fleet, was relayed there. And uh, I, I definitely got the short end of the stick on the Reeves. I, I tell you what, uh, especially from the enlisted guys, the officers not so much, but the enlisted guys, uh, they were going to make sure that I, I had to pay the price of being somebody's nephew. So, kind of an interesting story, at least to me. And I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs>